It's been a long time coming, but I know my my change gonna come. Right, we'll get to hear oh, yes, it you know, will. Be in the wee hours for me, but I will uh, watch the recordings before we regather um, together tomorrow evening. And I'm very grateful to be uh, part of this with the diverse group of people um, in the planning and uh, in the execution of this. Um, so thank you all. Um, so I was saying to my wife, Sue, this morning, um, a gathering between people from the United Kingdom and the United States. But are we united? What does it mean that our nations, our, way, our polit geopolitical ways of defining ourselves, both start with the word united? But we're obviously not united, whether it's over Brexit or over race or on our side of the pond over Trump or climate change or whatever it might be. Can we run away from the fact that our nation was founded on genocide of indigenous peoples and slavery? We sure don't like to acknowledge it, but there it is. Uh, and we're still grappling with it. Um, so um, our U.S. story is only a couple hundred years old. Your story is older, but the Jesus and the biblical story is even older. Um, and contrary to what we might imagine, um, it's a, not a united story either. And that's one of the key things I want to look at um, starting just a moment. So a term that I'd like to reintroduce us to, one that might seem obvious and we all sort of know what it means, but maybe not quite, is the word religion. Um, and we could spend a whole session on that, but since the clock is ticking on my 25 minutes, we won't. But I want to know just a couple of things about that term. Um, the original Latin meaning uh, root of the term, religio, so religion without the N, uh, means to bind again. So ligio, like a ligament, you know, that binds parts of your body, and re, again. So religio suggests that people have come apart. We've lost the connections that make us a body, as Paul says, right, to be the body of Christ. Um, and one of the ways that the ancient Israelites and Judahites grappled with that was by seeking to create common stories that would bind people again, that would lead to common practices, common perspectives uh, that would lead them forward. Um, and they argued about it. They did not come to clarity. But amazingly, as they argued about it, they made a decision that perhaps many of us wouldn't make. They included in their written collection the arguments of their opponents on whichever side they were. And I think that is one of the great gifts of the Bible that we've lost. Because sadly, often the tail wags the dog, and that tail being 2 Timothy 3.16, um, that one place in the entire collection of texts written over a huge number of years in many different situations that says all scripture is inspired, or God breathed, depending on your translation. Um, but uh, making that one verse control the writings of a thousand years of Israelites and Judahites is to miss what this amazing collection of writings is, and we've largely missed it. It's an argument um, between two opposing views. So I'd like to share some, uh, share my screen and show you a few things that hopefully will make some sense out of this, and we can see where Jesus fits in um, in this story. So um, first thing I have up here, as you can see, is, and I want to get, I'll see all of you at the same time too, if I can. Um, is Deuteronomy 7 against Matthew 5. Both parts of the Bible, of course. Deuteronomy 7 um, is Moses, part of Moses' speech after the Israelites have escaped ex the uh, um, Egyptians and have spent their 40 years in the wilderness, and now Moses is giving a speech as they're about to cross the Jordan River and enter into the Promised Land. And he says this, among other things, when the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are about to enter and occupy, and he clears away many nations, we could pause and think, wonder what that means, going to clear away many nations, and then he names them. I um, mean, the Lord your God gives them over to you. You must, and you defeat them, you must utterly destroy them. Make no covenant with them and show them no mercy. Do not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons, for that would turn away your children from following me and serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you, and he would destroy you quickly. And it goes on to describe how what you must do is destroy everything about them. And then Jesus comes along and says, you've heard it was said, you shall love your, your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies 
and pray for those who persecute you. So what do we make of these obviously conflicting passages? Um, Traditionally, but wrongly, um, one view has been, well, the God of Jesus is not the same as the God of the Old Testament. And as soon as we call it the Old Testament, we're engaging in that process because making it the Old Testament means it's somehow not as good as the New and Improved Testament, as opposed to calling it the Scriptures or the Hebrew Bible or the Hebrew Scriptures, something like, or even just the first Scriptures, something like that. Um, but there's more to it than that, um, because the only God that Jesus knew, and there's no question that Jesus knew God, didn't just know about God, didn't just have a theology, but knew God as one knows one's parent, a good parent, as we know from all the New Testament. Um, the only God he knows is the God of the Israelites, the God of his ancestors. Um, just like if we look at an Indian indigenous traditions in Australia, in the Great Plains of the United States, or the Celts, or the Druids in your part of the world, um, you know, they worship the gods of their ancestors. Uh, why would you worship other gods? Um, so Jesus worshiped Yahweh, the one who is. Um, and that's the only God there is that people are supposed to worship in the Hebrew Bible. So it's not a matter of a different God. Uh, another option, which ought to disturb us, would be, well, maybe God changed. Maybe God used to be a God of vengeance and violence, but along came Jesus, and suddenly now God's a God of love and peace and compassion. Hmm. Well, beware the God who can change that wildly, because then God could change back, right? We have to grapple with the fact that the Bible contains an argument. And here are some of the, um, the terms of the argument. So this is from Come Out My People. This is, as you can see, Table 1 and what I call the two religions the religion of creation and the religion of empire. One of my students said, I've never heard of the religion of creation before. I said, of course you haven't, I made it up. Um, but So you've probably never heard of it either, but that's okay. And the reason I'm using these terms is I was looking for something that didn't come with the baggage that the word Christianity does, or even Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, you know, what I call the name brand religions. Um, but to describe a pattern of understanding the world, our place in it, and our relationship with each other and to our creator, um, that are two ends of a spectrum. Um, any strong religion, which is to say a religion that binds people together across many aspects of life, which parenthetically Christianity sometimes does and sometimes doesn't, right? Um, so a strong religion has to take account of all of life, and these are some of those elements. Um, where power comes from, where power resides, where one encounters that power. What are we doing here? How should we organize our, ourselves in relation to each other and the material world? Um, what's our relations with people who aren't us? What do we owe as people connected? What's our relationship with the earth and land? And finally, what's our relationship with enemies? And on the religion of empire side, you tend to see this pattern. Not every element is there in every text. Again, these are points on a spectrum. Um, but you tend to see, for example, that to encounter God, you go through a system. You don't just go out on the earth, you go into a church that's mediated by a tradition and structures and official people who do official things, and that's how you do it. And that tends to justify an order of society that's hierarchical, where economics is grounded in a, an image of scarcity rather than an image of abundance. There's not enough. We end up in debt. We owe. Um, think of all the ways that we talk about money in terms of not enough. Uh, we could waste it and uh, we're trying to save it. One thing you can't do with time is save it. Right? It's ticking right away. Um, and so we'll talk a little more about that in a minute. Um, it tends to organize in urban metropolitan areas and see the human king as the presence of the supreme God. It treats others with suspicion and violence um, and um, the earth and its resources belong to those who can afford it and enemies are to be destroyed. But then there's this other side and if you've been looking while I've been talking, you see it's the, it's the opposite at every point. My premise for what we're doing today and the premise of the two books is um, Jesus entered into this argument and took this side. In other words, he didn't reject something called Judaism and invent something new called Christianity. He, like perhaps many of you or many people on, you know, in my uh, land who are entering into the arguments about who are we and what kind of people are we to be, took a side. 
and said that the God that I experience is one who welcomes the stranger, who loves enemies, who sees the earth as God's presence, um, and all people as a value, and all creation of a value. And as a result of that, the upholders of the religion of empire destroyed him. Um, a little bit answering Lawrence's uh, starting question. So that's the big premise here. And we'll have some chance for questions. I wish I could just say, how about questions? But I know how difficult it is, both on Zoom and in a limited time setting. So I'll just proceed here a little bit. So this chart gives us, excuse the color correction mistake there, um, a timeline of the order in which I'm presenting the construction of the biblical collection. And on the red top side are religion of empire texts and the green bottom side are the religion of creation texts, more grounded here, close to the earth. Um, and we're gonna look at just for a moment, the conflict between the two first stories, the story of David and Solomon and the justification of a monarchy in general and of why Solomon should be David's successor in particular, and the Exodus story as a counter story to that. In other words, the order in which the Bible was written has little to do with the order in which we read it from Genesis to Revelation which ought to make sense out of any collection of books, right? If you look at a collection of books on your shelf, you probably don't order them in the order in which they were written, right? Putting the oldest on the left and the newest on the right, you have a mixture of books on your shelf from ancient the Bible to modern fiction to whatever else you might have. Um, so there are other reasons why the Bible's in the order it is. And so across time then, across the monarchy, you see the prophets arising, trying to call people back to this more egalitarian, um, communal, earthy, non-debt sort of uh, uh, way of life. And then there's the compromise. At this point before the exile, and we won't have time to get into this now, but it's in the book, um, if you like, um, this place of attempting to bring them together around the Josiah compromise, which ended up failing to produce the books of Deuteronomy and Joshua. And then the exile came, producing radical alternatives to empire like Genesis. One of the most radical books in the Bible um, is the book of Genesis. Um, some other prophets and other writers like Second Isaiah, and then transitioning toward the time of Jesus. And one reason that my book is subtitled in the Bible and beyond is because it's really important to me that we include the collection that's known as First Enoch, which is not in the Bible, but was highly influential on Jesus and on the New Testament writers on presenting a religion of creation perspective across the course of time from Alexander the Great up to the Roman emperors. Uh, and then it ends here, as we'll see, with the Gospels and Paul being over here, and then this gradual movement of these writers going up this direction. That's where we'll go in the second half uh, today. So we're going to cover about 1,500 years in the next hour plus. All right. So what I want to do just briefly is look at the Solomon and Exodus story as um, a religion of empire narrative and a religion of creation counter narrative. So a couple of things just to draw your attention to that because you might think, uh, how, what? What is he talking about here? So just a couple of things from the text. So here in First Kings, and this is obviously table four from my book, description of Solomon. And note the words in bold here. And here's the Exodus description of Pharaoh in Exodus chapter one. Uh, words that are almost never used anywhere else. Um, not only wisdom, hakma in Hebrew, which also is, it can be translated shrewdly here, but the question of forced labor and taskmasters only in these places. The question of storage cities only in these places. The question of Pharaoh's daughter only in these places. <laughs> so that ought to at least arouse our suspicion of what's going on here between these two texts. What I'd like to suggest in the bigger picture is the David Solomon story written as almost every ancient culture did, writing was created to justify empire. That's why the technology, and it is a technology of course, of writing was invented, of memorializing narratives like the Babylonian Enuma Elish uh, or others that said why you ought to obey the king because the king has divine authority. Um, and so it should not surprise us, the earliest written text was a text to justify why David gets to be king and why his son Solomon gets to succeed him. And we're not gonna look at that story, but I would really encourage you if you're not, haven't looked at the David Solomon story in a while to go back to it. As Kevin and Lawrence know, I just finished teaching a, a class um, at Seattle University on the relationship between the David story and the Godfather films. 
And I think the parallel is extremely close. Uh, if you would know just in passing, David on his deathbed gives his son Solomon orders to execute his enemies. You know, and Solomon's first acts are acts of political assassination. Um, so that's what monarchy and empire do, right? They use death as a weapon um, and uh, live in luxury. It says Solomon ate off gold plates while they tax their citizens and ins even enslave them. Um, and the, que the theological question is, is God on the side of Solomon or is God on the side of people who want to escape Solomon? Um, in other words, is God in, on the side of the oppressive emperor or on the side of the oppressed? Let's look at another um, piece from, um, from the book so you can, oops, a little too big there, sorry. Um, this is the comparison of what makes for the glory of God. So in the Solomon story, Solomon builds the temple that David didn't build, and every all the leaders are gathered. Notice the elders, the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the father's houses. So the elite are all gathered, and then after the fact, it says all the people assembled to King Solomon. Notice they're not assembling to Yahweh. They're assembling to the king. And then the priests come out, and a cloud filled the house of Yahweh, and the glory of Yahweh filled the house. But Moses brought the people out to the earth to meet God. Notice no intermediary, no temple, no priests, no nobody, just at the foot of the mountain, like Jesus does, right, in Mark 9, as we'll look at in a moment. And the glory of God settled on the mountain. So in one, the glory of God is mediated through these official rituals, and the other, it's present for people to experience directly. So in other words, the Exodus story is claiming that God is on the side of those who want to be liberated from a king like Solomon, who was a cipher for Pharaoh in that story. Okay, so the, the argument is that kind of opposition takes place all the way through the Hebrew Bible, not as explicitly one story against the other, but these two patterns of life. All right. Got that so far before we make the jump to Jesus here, um, which I have to do pretty quickly here. Um, so um, Jesus um, is here, right? He stands on this side. Um, his opponents are here, and here's how he responds to those opponents. Um, so when he wants to um, meet God, where does he go? To the river, to the mountains, to the desert. When his disciples are confused, as we'll look at in a moment, that's where he takes them. Let's go up the mountain for a while, guys, and get away from the city, and we'll see what you experience there, right? And when these people find it threatening, um, he responds by harshly criticizing them as liars and misleaders, much like Ezekiel had the bad shepherds before the Babylonian exile 600 years earlier, all right? So we would see that throughout the entire um, New Testament. To make this real, let's look at a couple of texts. So I'm going to stop sharing that and share my biblical text for a moment here, if I can find that on my screen. Um, and hopefully I've got that up here. Uh, where to it go? Hmm. Here we go. All right. Did I do that right? Everybody have the Matthew 6 text on your screen? Have we got that? Okay. All right. So this is from the Sermon on the Mount. Should be familiar text to a lot of you, right? You've heard of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew's Gospel. Um, I'm catching it in the middle here. Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. For a slave will either hate the one and love the other, be devoted to the one, despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. We've all heard that before. And then he responds to their anxiety about stuff. Uh, Worry is not a good translation. Anxiety is a better one. Why are you anxious about food and drinking and all these things? And aren't we? not just them, aren't we? And he says, what good is that? What, what are you doing by being anxious about this stuff? And what? notice what he does as a comparison. He says, consider the flowers, right? If you want to understand God, look at creation. Look at the flowers. You know, they're not anxious. And then what does he make as the counterexample? You think this text was written for my purpose, but it wasn't, right? Compare a flower to Solomon in all his glory, not God's glory, in all his glory. And the flower reveals God more than Solomon does. 
that folks is what the point of this little exercise is about right is that if we want to see the glory of god and glory kabod from the hebrew um meaning you know what's reflected light like the moon is the glory of the sun because it reflects the moon you know the sun's light so um glory is what shines forth from some some other light so solomon's personal glory isn't the same as god's glory um which shines through creation okay um let's look at one how, i i lost track of when i started when are you keeping track of time how much do i have here lawrence or kevin uh five minutes all right good um let's look at uh mark's gospel for a second um any of you familiar with chad meyer's work from whom on whom i cut my teeth on biblical stuff 30 years ago um more than 30 years ago now um so i want to give a nod to chad's uh, landmark work in binding the strong man um using it now for this purpose so at the heart of what Ched calls the discipleship catechism, when Jesus takes the disciples away and puts some hard questions to them that to help them figure out what's really going on here, he asks them, who do you say that I, first, who do people say that I am? And then who do you say that I am? And they give some answers. And Peter said, you're the Messiah. And sternly ordered isn't strong enough here. Um, colloquially put, we'd say, he told them to shut up and don't tell anybody, like, shut up, like, you know, and then he began to teach them a different narrative, that the son of man or the human one must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, echoing the suffering servant story in Isaiah and Daniel 7 and 12, as we'll see, um, and rise again. That's out of Daniel. And he said this openly, and Peter took him aside and told him to shut up. But turning and looking at the disciples, he told Peter to shut up again. And said, get behind me, Satan. You're setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. In other words, Peter's hope, like in Luke's gospel, the disciples on the road to Emmaus' hope, we had been hoping, they say in Luke 24, had been hoping that it would be the Messiah, the David on the white horse, the guy who's going to get the army and whoop the Romans. And we get to have power now. And Jesus, of course, has been telling them all along, that's the wrong story, folks. That is not the story I'm claiming. Sure, you've been taught that story. Sure, that story's in the scripture, but it's not the real story. It's not the story of the God I know. The story of the God I know, Jesus tells them, is one who breaks the cycle of violence and empire by accepting suffering rather than uh, participating in it. And trusting that the God who creates us out of the dust of the earth in the first place, according to Genesis 2-7, can recreate us out of the dust of the earth, according to Daniel 12-2. Um, and the disciples' response is, huh? What? What's he do? Huh? And so what does he do? He takes them up a mountain. Right? Where they have the encounter. Where they have the direct experience. And so I'll stop the screen share now because I know I'm just about out of time. Because that experience is what it comes down to. I know my wife, Sue, who's a spiritual director and a mystic, would, um, and since this is going to be published on YouTube, would certainly be disturbed um, um, if I didn't mention, of course, I don't, I'm not mentioning it for her sake, but for ours, um, that at the heart of all this isn't something in our heads you know, an idea that I'm trying to convince you of or get you to think more about, although we, thinking is not a bad thing to do, but something we experience in our in and through our in our flesh, in and through our bodies, just like we're experiencing this pandemic in our bodies, aren't we? And I don't just mean the virus. I mean the stress. I mean the depression. I mean the exhaustion, right? Those are ways our bodies are saying our spirits aren't right. The situation we're in is not healthy. You don't need me to tell you that. Your body is telling you that. Our collective body is telling us that. Um, so I hope as we proceed through um, your small groups and our question and answers and through everything else we do in the next couple of days, um, that our central point will be not just to stay up here, but to get, mm, small screen, you can't see me doing this, to get down here, to get into our gut and um, into the heart of things um, where the God who made us lives in every fiber of our being. All right, that's part one. Uh, back to you, Kevin and Lawrence. Wes, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> um, I'm, I'm buzzing. I, I hope you are too. I'm going to